Hi, yeah. Okay, so we're on to section three of hormonal control, and we're going to cover the female hormones in this section that control reproduction. Okay, so the female menstrual cycle, probably most of you will have heard about, uh, it takes around 28 days, so about four weeks, which is just under a month. Uh, it's separated into two main phases. The first phase is from day one to day 14. Second phase is from day 14-ish onwards. So the first phase is called the follicular phase, and that is the idea that that is everything up to the point of ovulation. The second phase is called the luteal phase, which is the bit when, when it goes from ovulation to the actual bit of menstruation. The ovulation bit occurs around day 14, but obviously in certain people, slightly different. Some people it's slightly later, slightly long, slightly earlier, but you have to know to say it occurs around day 14. It doesn't occur at day 14, but it occurs around day 14. That is a common question that gets asked. But we'll talk more about the follicular phase and the luteal phase as we go on. Okay, so because female reproduction is cyclical, specific hormones have to be released at specific times, okay, to make sure that the right thing is happening at the right time. There are four hormones that work together to control the female menstrual cycle. Now, one of these you may have noticed has got the same name as one of the male hormones. It does a different job though, so you must have a distinction in your head between male FSH and female FSH. They are the same name, but they do a different thing. There's also oestrogen, which is the second one down, uh, LH, which is luteinizing hormone, and progesterone. Now remember, the same rule applies for naming the, the name of the hormone and where it's produced. If it's a bunch of letters, it's produced in the pituitary gland. So FSH and LH, I'm seeing their names are a bunch of letters, so I instantly know they are the pituitary gland. Oestrogen and progesterone have proper names, so not the pituitary gland. It's got to be something else that they are produced inside. And again, with the bunch of letters ones, you can know their names, but it's not absolutely essential to know their names. Uh, FSH, in this case, it's actually handy to know its name because follicle stimulating hormone is exactly what it does. It stimulates follicles. Luteinizing hormone, a little bit more obscure, but FSH might be handy to know. But again, in an exam situation, you do not have to name those things. The letters are enough. Okay, so FSH, first of all, this is the one that obviously there is a male and a female version of. Same idea, still producing a pituitary gland, still secreting travels in the blood, but this time it travels to the ovary. And that is where it will cause the development of a follicle. So the follicle is the bit that surrounds a maturing ova. Okay, as the follicle grows, it releases the, the second hormone, okay, and that is oestrogen, okay, so this is a bit of a weird one. Normally we think of endocrine glands releasing uh, hormones, but it's actually released by the growing follicle. So as the follicle gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it makes more and more oestrogen. Now the job of oestrogen is to build the endometrium. Now remember, the endometrium is the lining of the uterus, but you have to call it the endometrium. You can't call it the uterus lining, not sciencey enough. Then the other letter one, LH, so again, produced in the pituitary gland, secreted and travels in the blood, travels to the same place. High levels of ox high levels of oxygen, high levels of oestrogen are the thing that trigger this to happen. So when there is high levels of oestrogen, that is what actually triggers the pituitary gland to release it. And once it's released, it will travel to the ovary again. Uh, and LH, so luteinizing hormone, is the thing that actually co causes ovulation. So it actually causes the follicle to rupture and release that ova and that is the ova that's going to then travel down the oviduct and then potentially be fertilized uh, if it meets sperm and if not that will be the ova that is eventually released at the the end of the menstrual cycle. It's also got a second job so it develops the leftover bits of follicle into the corpus luteum okay now quite a lot of home ovulation tests what you do is you pee on a stick kind of like a pregnancy test and what happens is they're looking for the levels of lh if lh levels are low you are not ovulating if lh levels are high then you are ovulating and that is the time to have sex to try and conceive a baby and then finally we've got progesterone so remember how we kept talking about corpus luteum the leftover bits of the follicle how can they possibly be important well here is the reason why the corpus luteum releases progesterone progesterone thickens and vascularizes the endometrium now what that word vascularizes means is it grows blood vessels through the endometrium if we remember the the baby the infant the fetus has to tap into the mother's blood supply 
the, the blood vessels through the endometrium is how it taps in. The placenta is going to grow on top of the endometrium and tap into the mother's blood vessels. And that's where it's going to get its oxygen from, its glucose from and get rid of its waste materials. So we have to have blood vessels through that endometrium and it is progesterone that does that job. Now, only one over from one ovary is supposed to be released each month in, in, in ideal land. Um, so how does FSH know to only produce one follicle? If you release FSH through your whole bloodstream and it goes to both ovaries, how come you only get one follicle every month? There is no brain to the ovary and there is no brain to FSH. Instead, there's a self-regulation control cycle. And the genius of this is this. FSH is inhibited by estrogen. If you've got one big follicle making loads of estrogen, it goes and travels through the blood to stop more FSH being made. If FSH stops being made, you get no more follicles, meaning you only should have one follicle producing massive amounts of estrogen at a time. So uh, in terms of the end of the cycle, so the final kind of steps of what happens in this whole cycle is obviously F. The ova is unfertilized, so it's traveled along, it's not met sperm, so it's not became fertilized, and then a baby is not going to grow. When it reaches, uh, then it eventually reaches the uterus before it is going to leave the body. Progesterone will inhibit the production of LH when this happens, and this will cause the corpus luteum to break down, and this will stop the production of progesterone. The lack of oestrogen and progesterone will cause the endometrial layer to break down and that is what is a period, essentially. That endometrial layer shedding is what is the period and that is uh, what is menstruation. So it's technically you're back to day one. Day one of the cycle is the first day of menstruation. Now, this chart here is horrific and actually really helpful all at the same time. We can ignore the body temperature line, but the kind of skill you're expected with these four hormones is not only just saying it's made here, it does this, you need to get them in the right order. And the order is what makes it a really nice working cycle. So the idea is again, first you get FSH, which is gonna go start developing the follicle. As the follicle grows, it releases estrogen, which starts making the home for the fertilized egg, if it arrives, the fertilized ova. So that starts to build the endometrium. As estrogen levels spike, LH is then released, which causes ovulation. So the ova is released. The end of the follicular phase at day 14. Mm -hmm. And the Ish. ova travels down the oviduct. While this is happening, the leftover bits of the follicle are developed into the corpus luteum by LH as well. And the idea is they're releasing progesterone, which grow those blood vessels. You can see at the bottom, those red wiggly lines. It grows those blood vessels through the endometrium and makes it even thicker. And then the hope is, what well, the body is hoping for, is that a uh, fertilized ova will then reach the uterus and implant but in the majority of cases what happens is the unfertilized ova arrives it then signals that uh, basically the endometrium needs to start breaking down progesterone and estrogen levels crash down as you can see towards the end of the cycle oh sorry it's called estradiol on there but it's estrogen is what it means okay um, and they crash down and that causes the men period okay so that causes the endometrium to break down resulting in day one of the cycle again okay so this image is helpful and hurtful in equal quantities yeah. if you ignore the is. body temperature and can just go through each kind of column mm. as it comes and say what is happening in every row as it happens which sounds like a lot but if you can do that and you can describe this graph basically you will be fine However, if you're struggling with this, what's on the next slide might actually be more helpful for you. And that is just a, what does it, where's it released and what does it do? Oh, sorry, it's not on this side. I, there's one slide before it. There's one side before it. There's, this is an exam question that crops up. You want to go through it? Okay, yeah, so obviously sometimes a sperm might appear and an ova will meet a sperm in the oviduct and their nuclei will fuse and fertilization will occur. If that happens, when this fertilized zygote reaches the uterus, it will implant into the endometrium. And what this results in is progesterone levels will not drop. So they will stay high when this happens. Common exam question. And basically this is when, so your zygote is implanted, your progesterone levels have stayed high. So now you've not shed your endometrial lining. You can have a baby grow in there for about 40 weeks or nine months. It varies all the time what people are saying it is exactly now. But I'm we're sure, going I'm for sure about 40, 40 weeks. weeks. I, d I think nine months is a lie when this is, no, I'm not going to mention that no. one. That's a confidential. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
So let's look at the, the just let's just summarize the, the hormone cycle there before I massively got myself in trouble there mm -hmm. by mentioning people who shouldn't be mentioned on the show. Uh, right, so FSH is made in the pituitary gland because its name is a bunch of letters and it stimulates growth of a follicle around an immature ova. Okay. Estrogen, it's produced in the ovary, specifically the follicle is the thing that produces it. It will stimulate the growth of the endometrium and high concentrations will cause the release of the next hormone, which is LH. LH will be released from the pituitary gland, causes letters. It causes ovulation, function number one. Function number two develops the follicle bits into corpus luteum. Okay. And finally, progesterone. Uh, again, it is produced in the ovary. It's actually produced by the corpus luteum this time. And it causes more growth and the vascularization, so basically to grow lots of blood vessels for the endometrium and the endometrial layer. High concentrations of this will inhibit LH and FSH. It's a lot. We yeah. know. We know it's a lot. So but it's a nice story if you get your brain around it. It yeah. is a kind of continuous story and you can go step by step by step by step and just remember at the end, if in doubt, probably all inhibits itself. Mm -hmm. So uh, to summarise, you've had seven, seven, sorry, seven hormones, I've got the wrong number of fingers, uh, seven hormones to learn over male and female, one of which has the same name across both of them, which is a bit annoying. You need to know where they're produced, you need to know what they do at the most basic type of things. There are some um, essay questions that crop up about this, which says describe the hormonal control of the menstrual cycle is the most frequent one I've seen I think I've seen one describing the male ones but it tends to be male ones tend to be a picture and then name the hormone that's produced in part x or something that's like a that. shorter question because there's less yeah. of it however if you do if you do get the essay question about female hormones it's really easy to get loads of points because you usually mm -hmm. get one point for saying where it's made and one point for saying what it does. I don't know if that's still the procedure because the SQA do seem to be getting a bit harsher mm -hmm. on how much you have to say to get a mark but I kind of like questions about this because it seems to me you could get eight marks by saying Same the stuff this. that's on this slide and that's eight out of ten or possibly eight out of eight. So I think it's quite a nice little one. So this slide, very helpful for you. Um, mm -hmm. And that is the end of hormonal control. Uh, I know it's been a bit a bit of a journey, um, quite a lot to learn in there, but it's definitely worth it. And I'd, I'd kind of I'd gamble that it's going to come up in the exam. Something about this key area, because it's so big, will come up in the exam. So mm -hmm. worth worth looking at. And it's interesting. I like it, yeah. Okay, so the next key area, I have forgotten what it is. Oh, it's uh, the biology of controlling fertility. So that's all about how do you get someone pregnant and how do you stop get some a different person, obviously, pregnant. Or maybe the same person at, at different, different stages of their, their lives. Mm -hmm. Yes. We'll see you then.